A general thought within the field of management is that employees should generally have the same values or at least be aligned with the values of the company that they work for. And so how can we understand these values that companies have? How can we describe an organization's culture? Well, we can use the organizational culture profile with its seven dimensions to help us understand an organization's culture. They include innovation, aggressiveness, outcome orientation, stability, people orientation, team orientation, and detail orientation. So understanding these values have been brought to us by consultants Charles O'Reilly, Jennifer Chapman, and David Caldwell. And they are helping us assess what's called person organization fit. That is, does the employee fit value-wise with the organization that they work for? Their theory suggests that employees should generally have the same basic cultural values such as the company that they work for. We have the seven dimensions of culture listed on the first slide. The first one being innovation. Companies or people who want new opportunities to invent new products or services, they have great ideas and creativity, they should work for a company that is innovative in their culture. Companies that are innovative, they encourage innovation, creativity, and they also give people freedom. They empower people to work on their ideas, the projects that they have. This will result in something that's probably, hopefully useful, both to the employee as well as the company itself. The second dimension is aggressive. Some companies that are out there really focus on collaboration. Other companies really value competition. And a company that is said to be aggressive tend to value aggressive competition. Uh, Microsoft is a company that often is being described as being more aggressive. The third one is outcome orientation. And these organizations that focus on out outcomes they're all about their results. They focus on sales, they focus on performance, they train their employees to have high levels of output. They are outcome oriented. Number four is being stable. If you work for a stable company, you know exactly what is going on. You know who the leadership is, you know what the structure looks like, you know what your roles and responsibilities are, you know what you are expected to do. Companies that have everything laid out and clearly communicated, such as a bureaucracy, for instance, tend to be a very stable organization where we have consistency. You can also be an organization that is people-oriented. And if you work for a people-oriented company, you feel that the company actually cares about you. They signal that through their actions, through their communications, and their foundations lay in fairness and trust and compassion. You feel respected and you feel treated with dignity. And as a result, companies that have a people orientation tend to have a very loyal and dedicated workforce. Number six is team orientation. If you work for a company that is strong in their team value, you will see that your peers and your colleagues really enjoy collaboration and cooperation. They help each other and support each other. And we work in teams and we view that as something that is joyful as opposed to something that is competitive. The company Whole Foods, which is a grocery chain within the United States, ha have been using a team-based structure where teams are empowered to make decisions. And they have been doing that since essentially inception. So a very team-focused collaborative organization. 
this tends to create strong and solid working relationships within these groups. Lastly, we have something called detail orientation. And as you might guess, a company that is considered to be detail oriented tends to be very, very focused on the small things and they pay a lot of attention to details in everything. A lot of the time we're gonna find a detail oriented organization in a customer oriented industry where it's really important that we have metrics and precisions. For instance, customer service like the Four Seasons Hotel, they tend to be very detail oriented. So to be happy working for a detail oriented organization, it should be in your nature to have an eye for detail and you should be thriving on those small little details. We can also talk about what a strong culture is. A strong culture tends to happen when most people in the organization agree on what the culture is. So if you walk into an organization and ask people to describe it, and then you ask the next person to describe it and the third person to describe it, they generally say the same thing. They describe the corporation, the culture with the same words, essentially. So when that happens, we can say that we have a strong culture. A strong culture is one that is shared by most of the employees and they show consensus. They show agreement on the shared values of the organization. They also believe in these values. The values are said to be deeply held. So the employees actually agree on what the culture is and they do care about those values. A strong culture is a great thing if it is the right culture for your organization so that you can be successful in the industry you're competing in. However, if you have a strong culture that is really hindering good performance, it truly is a liability. Strong cultures are very hard to change. And if you have a low performing, um, toxic culture that is strongly held, that can be a great challenge for an organization. Of course, we can have multiple cultures within an organization. We can call them subcultures or we can call them countercultures. Subcultures are small groupings where in these small groupings, they have a set of values that are specific to that group. So this is a small group or unit that have their own values. We call them a subculture if they're still aligned generally with the larger organization's values. So it's not really a problem. So that can typically happen when you have maybe an office in a different geographical area, you have a branch that have a very strong leader, you have a, a department within an organization that focuses on something that the rest of the organization does not, for instance, your legal department. And so we can say we have a subculture when that happens, and that is typically not a problem for organizations. However, if you have a counterculture, that's my, when we might see a challenge because a, <laughs> a counterculture is when a small group or a unit have shared values and beliefs that are in opposition to the values of the larger organizational culture. So you have a separate department, you have a leader, and they have values that are in opposition. They disagree with the values of the broader uh, organization, and that is also a liability much like a strong culture that doesn't work for you. In summary, and for our discussion questions to further your learning. Number one, think about an organization that you're familiar with. On the basis of this OCP, the OCP profile, the key dimensions of organizational culture, how would you characterize that company's culture? Number two, out of the seven culture dimension that we described, which dimension do you think would lead to a higher level of employee satisfaction and retention? Which one would be related to company performance? Number three, what are the pros and cons of an outcome-oriented culture? Four, 
When bureaucracies were first invented, they were considered quite innovative. Do you think that different cultures are more or less effective at different points in time and in different industries? Explain your answer. Number five, could you imagine an effective use of subcultures within an organization? What do you think? That's all for today. See you next time. Thank you. Bye-bye.